evening, everybody. Welcome to uh, Hashing Over History. What's today? March 9th. Uh, we like to again welcome everyone. We got, uh, like the other weeks, we have a great crowd. So thank you for coming out. Uh, we have a great speaker today. Uh, a lot of people, I believe, are in, I'm not even going to say his name yet. Is there anyone in here who does not know who we got today? All right, we have Brad Minnick. Uh, and Brad, uh, he's probably going to tell you this. <laughs> But his, his mom was a uh, Clayton historian at one time, so a lot of her knowledge was probably talked about in the house, so he might be sharing some things. But uh, again, I'm Tom uh, LeClaire, I am the Clayton historian, and I welcome to you all to Hashing Over History, our sesquicentennial year, where we have partnered again with the Thousand Island Museum, Historian's Office, the sesquicentennial committee, and the Clayton Opera House. Later on today at noon, we got Julie Garzies talking about the history of the Opera House. So if you're free, come on back at noon. But again, uh, thank you. At this time, Brad, I am going to turn the time over well, to you. Thank, thank you very much, Tom, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my father was born in Rising City, Nebraska, which is neither Rising nor a city. Uh, it's 400 people. He was the youngest child of a farm family of seven children, enlisted uh, in the Army, uh, was sent to Fort Drum to train for World War II. My mother was uh, born and raised in Lowville. Uh, she was a volunteer U.S. outpost just during the war at Pine Camp. She met my father, they fell in love. Uh, he went off to the South Pacific, I actually found here her little scrap, one of her little scrapbooks that she made for my father and said to him, if anybody would like to take a look at that. Uh, when the war was over, he didn't even stop in Nebraska. He came right back up to Wildwood, New York and married my mother. Believe it or not, they went on their honeymoon to Nebraska. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that she could meet the in-laws. Uh, uh, my father was a, a conservationist by training. My mother was a teacher and librarian by training. In uh, 1961, my father was working for the New York State Conservation Department when he was transferred to Watertown from Ithaca. Uh, being a, from a farm family in rural Nebraska, he didn't want to live in the city of Watertown, so my parents bought a home here in Clayton. So in 1961, the Minnicks arrived in Clayton, uh, Dick Minnick, Virginia Minnick, uh, my brother David, who was 11 at the time, me, Bradford, who was five, and my sister Patty, who was two. Uh, my parents got pretty active in the community while they were here. My father was a uh, uh, president of the Lions Club. He was a uh, trustee of the Methodist Church. He was a fireman. My mother. Uh, started the what is now the research library at the Thousand Isles Museum when the museum was located in this building down in the second floor where I think Julie Garnsey's office is. There was a room with a big glass wall and a door in it and that was the first research room that has since become the library that was started by my mom and everything in there at that time was stuff that she had collected from someplace. Uh, she also, as many of you know, was a librarian at Hong Library for about 17 years. Uh, while she was there, she started the annual book sales, uh, Hong Library book sale during the summer to raise money for the uh, library. She also uh, used to uh, hatch Easter eggs every Easter for the kids, so she'd be in there worrying and fretting of me in this uh, terrarium with the, the, the RDA going to hatch in time and all that kind of stuff. She also, uh, up here, was a substitute teacher, which was, to me, my least favorite occupation for her uh, and my sister when we were at school because she'd get the call in the morning, I'm teaching. And our first question would be, for who? <laughs> uh, she was also in the Travers Club, and in that role is the Travers Club, apparently, that put together this little booklet in commemoration of the 100th anniversary of Clayton. I remember my mother was basically the editor of this and wrote a lot of it and fretted over this for many, many hours also that I remember. 
uh, our house uh, at 811 Union Street, the last block of Union Street uh, before you get to uh, French Creek. Uh, beautiful uh, four bedroom house. This is the first time I had my own room. Uh, it had a wrap, it still does, a wraparound porch on two sides. And the time it had a full attic, huge attic upstairs. And uh, we spent hours and hours and hours as kids. We put dress up up there, we play on our train table, we sleep overnight and camp out. Uh, just fabulous memories of uh, the attic. And the attic had a three window dormer that overlooks French Creek Bay. And my room, bedroom, was right below it. And my window looked out over French Creek Bay. So uh, the view was of the bay out to Bartlett Point and directly across. Uh, or at that time was uh, Denny's Cottages. My first memory in our house was running up the stairs. When we moved up here, we found out that, oh my God, they have ships up here. Uh, and we were hooked. And every time there was a ship, one of us, my mother, somebody would, ship! And we'd all run upstairs and up to the attic and look out the dormer windows. And even though the ship was way out there, by Bartless Point, it was still exciting every time, and it never got old. <laughs> uh, our neighborhood was basically uh, that block of Union Street, uh, Theresa Street, uh, Reeves Street, Reeves Street, and uh, a little bit of State Street. Uh, when it came to uh, playing and entertaining ourselves, quite frankly, uh, we never found much of a need to ever cross James Street to the other side. Uh, so I wasn't that familiar with the other side of town as I was growing up here. Uh, on our street, uh, on the right next door to us were the Marshalls. I think Mr. Marshall uh, was a custodian, custodian at the school. On the left, there was a vacant lot, and then the next house, which was uh, closest to the water, uh, was Aunt Emma's house. I never did know whose aunt Emma was, uh, but as a kid, she seemed to be 150 years old. She had no teeth and white hair, and she sat in a rocking chair on the porch every day and just watched all the goings on in the street. And one thing that I remember and really liked about growing up here was that people sat on their porches <laughs> and talked to each other and talked to people that were walking by and such. And my mother spent half her life probably sitting on the porch in our house. Uh, Another thing that I liked about our neighborhood uh, was our secret, was our secret, secret little grocery store on Reeves Street. There was a lady on Reeves Street, I forget what her name was, but if you walked up her steps to her house, if you went straight in the door, you'd go to her house, but if you turned to the left, you walked into a little room and there was a little L-shaped counter there. And she had shelves behind, and you go over with your little list, and you wanted chicken noodle soup and this and that. I remember her cutting the bologna, um, the meat cutter. I always thought that was pretty cool. And I thought, wow, we're pretty special. We don't have to go to those big stores because we have our own little grocery store in our neighborhood. Uh, some early memories. My parents actually were the people that reintroduced wild turkeys to, uh, to the Thousand Islands. My father, being a conservationist in uh, Ithaca, when he moved up here, uh, one of the first trips my parents told me uh, was in a station wagon. They had all the windows rolled down, rolled down because it stuck to high heaven. They had all these uh, wild turkeys in the back in cages to release up here. So maybe the wild turkeys crossing my lawn now are descendants of my parents. Uh, uh, wild turkeys. Speaking of uh, that type of thing, my father being a conservationist up here, I remember going with him to tag geese, putting little tags on their feet. I remember going up with him into the Adirondacks to, uh, you know, to inspect deer during deer hunting season. Uh, I have a picture up here that uh, shows our house from French Creek Bay, and a picture up here of my father with my sister uh, and me as we were helping him uh, tag geese. One other memory I have uh, was at that time, uh, the uh, American Boat Line double-decker tour boats uh, were moored in the center of French Creek. Well, one night there was a storm or something. I was just a real little kid, and I think their newest boat was the Neptune, and somehow that broke loose from its mooring, and it was floating around <laughs> in French Creek Bay, and it ended up at the foot of Union Street. 
and literally it had been it had been pushed up so the bottom was actually on part of the land. And this was dark. It was like one o'clock in the morning or something. I remember being down there with my father, and I'm this little kid, and I looked up, and here's this huge. This thing looked like the Titanic to me. Uh, my age, just sitting down there at the end of the street. Uh, I remember uh, the fun we had at Halloween here back in the day. Uh, most families made the costumes for their kids. And one year, my parents made this fabulous Indian costume for me. It uh, made out of burlap sacks, and it was embroidered on the front and the back with an eagle design and such that my mother did and my father dyed it, and he put the fringe on both arms and all down the legs, and I had a long cloth that was also uh, embroidered, and I think that year I actually won a prize downstairs uh, because we used to come to the opera house for our um, uh, Halloween festivities and be judged walking around in front of the stage down there. Uh, when I was a little older in high school, we didn't do that. We took shaving cream and soap and <laughs> would go around and soap people's windows and uh, their cars and such. That's the worst thing I think I ever did at Clayton. <laughs> uh, I was here for the first boat show, the first antique show, the first decoy show, the first Christmas parade. Uh, the Christmas parades were always fun, especially at the beginning because it was so competitive back then. Some of you might remember the churches each had a float, and we, oh, it was a big secret, you know, where, where are they, Method is doing their float, and what are they doing, and you'd find a garage, and you had to get a flatbed truck to be your float and such, and one of the floats, I remember one year, because I was on it, was a, uh, and uh, the Methodist Church float, which was a big Advent wreath, but rather than the wreath lying flat on the truck with the candle sticking up, the wreath was actually turned on its side, so it stood up. Turns out it was too tall to fit under the underground or the overhead wires. <laughs> so my father was walking along in front of the float with one of those poles like in the old school that you've used to open the windows and holding up the wires so that the uh, float can make it down uh, James Street and Riverside Drive. Uh, we were Methodists. We were uh, Chevy people, not Ford people, which meant we were Finney people, not Kittle people. Uh, we, uh, my doctor was Hetty. My dentist was not uh, Epolito. I had Dr. Maloney. I can remember uh, Dorothy Painter as mayor. I remember Bob Purcell as, as mayor. Uh, I remember that Bob McEwen was the congressman. And as an interesting aside, he retired in 1980. In 1980, a guy by the name of Bob McEwen, same spelling, ran for Congress from a district in Ohio. Uh, well, Bob McEwen of New York sent Bob McEwen of Ohio, always unused bumper stickers, campaign posters and such, and he used them. And actually, I was hired to be his first press secretary. So there was actually a little story in the paper about the old Bob McEwen and the new Bob McEwen and how Brad from Clayton worked, worked for the new Bob McEwen. Uh, Doug Barkley, as I mentioned, was a senator, state senator. And uh, just a little aside there, years later, he became at one point uh, U.S. ambassador to El Salvador. Uh, at the time, I was running a nonprofit uh, organization in Washington that did international exchanges of young politicians like mayors and city council members, state legislators and, legislators and such. So I took a delegation down to El Salvador when he was ambassador. And I remember our first meeting in, with him in the embassy uh, in his conference room, and he had us go around and introduce ourselves. When I got to me, I said, well, Ambassador, I'm proud to say that I'm probably the only person in the room that ever had a chance to vote for you. And what, the very first time I ever voted in an election, I voted for you. And he was thrilled just that somebody knew where the heck he came from. Another memory in that regard was uh, um, the firemen's conventions that they used to hold here in the village every so often. And I do collect uh, uh, Thousand Islands memorabilia. I found in my uh, collection, here is a souvenir program for the 18th annual New York State Firemen's Convention held here in Clayton in 1915. 
And if one looks at the program in here, on the first day at uh, 7.30, there was a band concert, and at 9 p.m., there was a fireman's dance at the Opera House, right downstairs in 1915. One other thing I noticed in going through here, actually, is uh, all the local businesses had ads at the time, including this one for the Herald House, uh, which I was interested to see. Uh, one thing I loved about the firemen's conventions was all the fire trucks uh, being in town and uh, being, filling up the motels. I used to ride my bike around town at night. I, I've always loved growing up here and the whole tourist side of the Thousand Islands. And I would ride my bike around Clayton every night and check on the motels. Were there no vacancy sign on? Were there cars in the parking lot? You know, there were two little motels uh, on James Street before School Street. There was the St. Lawrence Motor Lodge. There was the Maranham uh, on Alexander and, and Union, the Calumet Motel. Uh, one across from the gas station at the stoplight at Graves, I forget what that one was called. Uh, and I go around almost every night and check and see if they were doing good. And when the conventions came and they were totally filled with different colored fire trucks in each one of them and kind of rowdy and then all those wonderful uh, contests and such that they did uh, downtown and actually back here in, in 1915, <laughs> On the second day, uh, they had a straightaway ho a hose race. They had a grease pole over water event. They had a three-legged race. Firemen only could participate in that one. Uh, a ladder race. Uh, and even growing up, they were still doing this type of thing into the 70s, at least. Uh, and I think, for liability reasons, like many other things, that went away unfortunately, so we don't get to have that kind of fun uh, anymore. Uh, some remembrances from uh, my school days. Uh, I found, actually, in elementary school yearbooks. Some of you might have seen these before. This has my name on it, and uh, my picture's in here. I'm Mrs. Keogh's fifth grade. I don't remember Mrs. Keogh, but um, I was in her fifth grade. Uh, Dr. Forbes was the superintendent, Sam Gardino was the principal and later my uh, wrestling coach. Uh, I could walk to school every day and back, you know, of course uphill both directions, barefoot. Uh, I remember in elementary school that if you got selected to go upstairs, you know, at that time it was kindergarten through sixth grade downstairs, seven through twelve upstairs. Well, if you got asked by your teacher to go upstairs maybe to get something from the library or whatever, the teachers always said, if the bell rings when you're up there, get against the wall. Because all the giants are going to come out and they're going to be changing classrooms and you don't want to get hurt. Uh, we had study hall on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock in the afternoon so that all the Catholics could go down to their religious instruction. Uh, I also found, uh, I'm a meat and potato guy, you couldn't get a bologna sandwich in the public school cafeteria on Fridays because, well, Catholics, uh, they have fish sandwiches. Uh, I thought growing up that the, every community, the largest church in every community had to be a Catholic church. It was around here in every community. It wasn't until I got out of Clayton that I discovered that that wasn't true. I, you know, it's interesting, you, you, wherever you grow up, there's stuff you don't know. You, you haven't learned. Uh, I went to school in Washington. My first week, a kid banged on my uh, dorm room door, and I opened the door, and he said, hey, would you like to buy a bag of bagels? And I said, what's a bagel? <laughs> I had no idea what a bagel was at that point. I don't think they probably sold them up here in the store at that point. Uh, I had figured out pretty accurately uh, whether or not we'd have school the next day when it snowed. Uh, and my system was, if the snowplow made it down our block of Union Street in the middle of the night, that meant the main roads were done and we'd have school. But if the plow had not made it down our street, it would be very, very, very If the, if the snow plow would not come through, and I would listen, you know, subconsciously, if the plow hadn't come through, pretty good chance that the road, main roads weren't done yet, which meant no school for us the next day. Uh, in the late 60s, 
I can still remember this as a kid. There was this idea to combine the Clayton and Kate Vincent schools together, which required building a new school, which required a bond issue. And my recollection was it took two or three times for the community to actually uh, get the uh, project whittled down to the point where they felt like they could support the bond issue. Well, I remember my father taking me with him to vote on the first bond issue. And he was, uh, the whole way, he was like, oh, this, this thing is like the Cadillac of all schools. They don't need all the stuff they're putting in there. And there's a separate thing on there you have to vote for if you want to have an indoor swimming pool. And why do you need that in the school? You've got the whole river up here. So <laughs> yeah, that's where you can learn to swim. That's where you are learning to swim, he told me. And so I walk into the booth with him, and it says, you know, bond issue for the school. He goes, yes. Bond issue for the pool? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> so we, we come out and I said, Dad, I thought you didn't like this. And he said, I want the very best education possible for my kids. <laughs> uh, so that school opened in 1973. I was a junior. So my junior year, we moved into the school. It hadn't been, it wasn't even finished yet. The auditorium wasn't done. The gym wasn't done. The lockers were barely in. Uh, it was an opportunity to make new friends. We got to vote on, the whole school got to decide what the name of our teams was going to be. And we all, and the winner was Vikings, and I guess they still are. Uh, one of my favorite memories of, of high school, quite frankly, was uh, our music program. The music program, I thought, in Thousand Islands was fabulous. We had a senior band, a senior choir, a junior band, a junior choir, a pet band, a, uh, we even had a jazz band. A, a program started, you know, by, uh, originally by Frank Satchi uh, and Bob Connor and later uh, Mr. Davis after Mr. Satchi went to Watertown and later Steve Warden. Uh, and I loved band. I, I was in the choir. I played baritone horn in the band. Uh, we went to area all state at that time, and that meant we got out of school that day, and we would be raided. And I remember kids from the other schools would come to hear our senior choir sing because we always competed in the highest grade and always got an A with uh, almost always with Bob Connor. Uh, I remember in band. Uh, we even had a little pet band that uh, played at the high school football games. We also had uh, uh, the full band actually played at graduation. When the senior class graduated, I remember the band being set up on the floor of the school up here. Uh, and we played pomp and circumstance and such. Uh, the favorite thing for me, however, was uh, the marching band. And we had fabulous uniforms, and we marched in the Memorial Day Parade and the Fireman's Day Parade. The favorite one was the Goodwill Day Parade. And for those of you who remember that, it would alternate every uh, summer one year and be on our side of the river, the next year on the other side. Well, when it was on the other side of the river in Canada, we were very excited in the band because they sold fireworks over there that were illegal over here. <laughs> And we had instrument cases. And I had a bit, because <laughs> I played the baritone. So uh, we would fill our cases with uh, fireworks, you know, be on the bus and get to customs, and the custom agent would get on the bus. Does anyone have anything illegal? No. <laughs> and he'd smile, get off the bus. My problem was I couldn't set the fireworks that I bought uh, off of my house because directly across the street with the Glendennings, and Mr. Glendenning was a customs officer. <laughs> I was convinced that if he found out that I had contraband fireworks, that I'd get arrested. <laughs> I would always go to somebody else's place to do that. Uh, so I was in the second graduating class at Thousand Islands, uh, at the new Thousand Islands High School, and I actually found the uh, picture of our graduating class. Uh, this was taken in the U.S. Capitol the first time I was ever in Washington. And, uh, I had applied to go to college in Washington, uh, hadn't been accepted yet, as I recall. Uh, and so I was thrilled to be able to, you know, to be in Washington. And, and I remember uh, standing outside the gates of the White House, the first time I'd ever seen the White House, and I'm looking in there. Uh, no idea that later in my life that I'd be going to meetings there, that I'd actually 
uh, meet a president of the United States in the Oval Office, that, that I would have the, the, the right to go uh, tour the Christmas decorations uh, during the Christmas season. And in that regard, uh, when my mother was moving with us in Washington, I was a political appointee of uh, George W. Bush's administration and at the State Department, and so I was invited to go see the Christmas decorations, and they have a, the Marine Band playing in the lobby and such. It's really kind of cool. Uh, and so Jamie and I took my mother, and my mother at the time was in a wheelchair. Well, when you come in to tour the Christmas decorations, you start on the east side of the White House where the First Lady staff is, and you walk down this long colonnade past uh, where the movie theater was, and on the other side was Jackie Kennedy's garden. And when you got to the end of the colonnade, or the corridor, uh, there was a, a huge staircase that took you up to the ground, to the state floors, where the East Room was in the state dining room. Well, my mother obviously could not uh, walk up the stairs because she was in this uh, in a wheelchair. So there was a, a Secret Service agent standing there and he pointed to me and he said, well, why don't you go up the stairs and, and uh, wait in the foyer and uh, you, to Jamie, come with her, my mother, and I'll take you in the elevator. Teeny, teeny little elevator. Very, I guess Jamie said very hard to even get all three of us in there. Well, apparently the Secret Service agent happened to ask, oh, where are you from, ma'am? Well, my mother, you know, everywhere. Oh, I'm from Clayton Thousand Islands, and she was really disappointed that people didn't know where that was. Well, it turned out that this Secret Service agent knew exactly where it was because he was from Ham. <laughs> so I'm up there in the foyer on the state floor waiting. Where are they? Where are they? Well, once he found that out, they didn't come up to the state floor. They went back down to the basement. He wheeled her down to see the burn marks from the 1812 war and, and, Nick, and Nixon's uh, bowling alley. And I'm up there, where are these? Where are they? Uh, it, it just, that, that was a hoot. Um, I was in uh, Cub Scout and Boy Scouts. I found a picture of us at, uh, I think this was at Camp Porta Ferry. And uh, here's our Cub Scout pack. My mother was a den mother. Uh, they had blue and gold dinners, they were called, called and you had a theme for it. Uh, this year, it, it was a space theme, and my father helped us make these little rockets and this little banner that we put on our part of the table and such, and I think the dinner was actually in the old uh, Catholic school, St. Mary's. Uh, because it was a space theme, we actually wrote to John Glenn as a pack, and he wrote back, and here's me holding the letter. And here is the chairman of the board of the Opera House, now Tim Malone, <laughs> holding the, uh, the autographed picture from John Glenn, my sister in the front here. And over here is the historian's brother, Henry, in our, little, in our pack here. Uh, my favorite memory from Boy Scouts was to earn one of the merit badges, you had to uh, be able to find your way through some sort of nature trail. Well, my father uh, developed a nature trail for me to follow. He took me down across uh, State Street to what is now Wilbur Wall's property, and at that time it was just one big field, and it went from uh, Theresa Street basically all the way up to the ice cream stand. So my father had done this very elaborate and quite terrific uh, nature trail for me to follow. And lo and behold, where did it end up? But at the ice cream stand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when it came to jobs, uh, I had some jobs here growing up. I was a paper boy. Uh, my uh, route included, it went from O'Brien's all the way down uh, Riverside Drive and all the way around Riverside Drive over to Mercer's, uh, where Gil Mercer got the paper. I also uh, in, included on the route was the Hubbard House at that point and uh, the uh, Harold House at that point. I used to deliver papers there. I also worked at Ellis's one summer, uh, which was right next to the boat tours. Once you bought your boat tour ticket, you had to walk through Ellis's to get on the boat because they had a, a staircase in the back that people queued up on. Uh, I was the guy that came in early, early in the morning and mopped the floor, took out the garbage, did all that kind of stuff. 
uh, there was a little uh, uh, um, dining room in the back on a porch called, I think it was called Fishbowl or the Golden Fish or something like that. Anyways, and they had a lunch counter all the way down one side of the of the uh, of Ellis's. It was amazing to me the number of people that would buy their ticket to get on a tour boat. They come in and decide to order breakfast, waiting for the boat. They'd be sitting there in this restaurant, this double decker boat, and pull off with the second deck equal to where they were. They go, Is that our boat? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know. Okay, hey, 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 gotta go, gotta go. Uh, I spent a couple summers mowing uh, Roosevelt Trailer Park because John Connor, who was in my class, so I was told, was allergic to. Uh, uh, grass, and uh, they didn't have a riding mower at that point, so literally I would hand mow this entire place out there uh, on uh, Route 12 uh, The last job I had up here, uh, don't know quite how that came about, I think maybe Gordon Ciro or and or uh, uh, Vince D might have had something to do with it. I was on the rake crew at Thousand Island Park. I was told that it was in the lease of the people of Thousand Island Park that they, the entire property got raked once a year. And I was placed on the rake crew, and we raked the entire Thousand Island Park. Well, I was a redhead at the time, and the first day we were raking the big green that goes from the hotel and the ice cream shop down to the, uh, down to the pier. And I was so sunburned that by the next day, I felt like, God, this is only the second day. I'm never going to survive in this job, but somehow I did. Uh, one job that I always wanted but never was able to secure was uh, working on the boat tours. Uh, I wasn't connected enough in the village really to get that job as a kid. And most of those jobs were taken by the faculty at the school anyways, because that's what they did for their summer employment, is hawking boat tours and such. So I never got to do that, unfortunately. Well, I mentioned I used to bike around the town, uh, you know, checking on the motels and see how business was doing and such. Uh, I've always loved uh, the Thousand Islands. My whole life, I found in my archives, here's a, a uh, drawing that I did. This is dated November 23rd, 1967. It's a gas station on a road with a sign here, Ride the Best, American Boat Line, Clayton, New York, 10 miles. <laughs> and I also found an essay that I wrote on September 23rd, 1968 from my social studies class called The Thousand Islands. The Thousand Islands is an exciting place to visit. Through the th throughout the Thousand Islands, there are many small towns such as Clayton, Alexandria Bay, and Cape Vincent. They are all full of resort hotels, motels, and restaurants. In the Thousand Islands, you might want to take a boat tour or play one of the many golf courses. Then you might want to go fishing or swimming. Just two more things of the many things to do in the Thousand Islands. All summer long, the, the towns of the Thousand Islands are busy and popping with tourists. Sometime in August, Clayton features Old Home Week, a week of fun-filled activities of old times, Alexandria Bay, with an attack of pirates on the town. All in all, the Thousand Islands are a very wonderful place to visit. And I got an excellent time here from <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Uh, I had a boat for two years. Uh, we bought it secondhand at Chalks. Uh, it already had a name, it was the Brown Noser. It was called, <laughs> believe it or not. And I had it uh, two summers. The first summer after I got it, I used it a little bit, and then I found out I was going abroad as an exchange student. Uh, so the boat ended up in the garage. Uh, the next summer, uh, I had it out, but I had been invited back by my host family from the previous summer. So I spent the summer abroad again, and by the time I got back, my mother had sold the boat. <laughs> oh, you're never here, Brad. <laughs> Uh, some defining, three defining moments in growing up here that I have always uh, remembered. The first was in 1968. Uh, uh, Tony Pacific's mom mentioned this, going out to the 30th anniversary of the, of the opening of the TI Bridge. There was a big, huge uh, uh, ceremony out there at the bridge. 
my mother had taken me out of school to go to this. And uh, the, the Governor Rockefeller was the speaker. And I still remember uh, him coming in underneath the brick, from underneath, walking underneath the bridge, and he was waving to everyone in a big smile, and he gave a great uh, little speech, and I just thought it was all so exciting him to see a governor. Our governor, he runs the whole state, and that's one of the things, along with the uh, political uh, campaign uh, storefronts that we used to have downtown during presidential election years, both parties and have bunting and they have bumper stickers and buttons and American flags and all this stuff. And I think a combination of those two things is what sparked my interest in politics, which led to a significant portion of my uh, political career, or, or professional career working in domestic politics at the uh, uh, federal and state level. So that was the first defining moment for me. The second was a year later in 1969, uh, February 18th, late afternoon, uh, to be specific. Uh, my dad died unexpectedly of a heart attack at the age of 49. Uh, at home, my sister and I were there at the time, I and mean, it's a, one of those memories you will never ever forget. Uh, Pauline Zach, uh, you know, showing up uh, from uh, James Street. How the heck they knew already? I don't know. And she was over there before the ambulance. Ah. Anyways, uh, that made me grow up uh, earlier than I probably would have otherwise, uh, because uh, unlike many families here in Clayton. We weren't related to anybody. <laughs> my father's relatives were all in Nebraska. My mother's relatives were all gone, and the couple that were left were old and lived in Wellville. So after the funeral and coming back to the house and all the food and everything, and four days of all this running around and people, all of a sudden there was my, my brother had to go back to college. He was a freshman, so there was my mother, her 12-year-old son Brad, and her nine-year-old daughter Patty having to figure it out now, and we did. And the community helped us, and that's one of the things that's always made me appreciative to the village of Clayton. Uh, Mr. Scales on our street, my mother needed a project to occupy her. He came over and they spent hours and days refinishing the staircase of the house. Uh, that's why it looks the way it does now. Uh, the, uh, Mr. Glenn Denning, the customs officer, helped me with my long division because I didn't have my dad to help me anymore. And they would have us come over uh, for afternoon and dinner every Sunday uh, after my dad died. It was stuff like that that made me think, like, you know, this is really a cool place. You know, I could have been lived someplace else. That was definitely a defining moment. The third defining moment was in 1973 when I was a junior in high school and I was selected to be a summer exchange student. Now, I think Shirley Carpenter and Vivian Black and maybe a couple other people had something to say about that. Uh, my mother encouraged me to apply. I refused. I said, I'm not captain of the football team. I'm not the most popular guy. I'm not the best musician. You know, why would they pick me? Fill it out, she said. <laughs> I did, and lo and behold, I got selected. And I was sent to Sweden for a summer. Now, I had never even been to New York City before. And I had to fly to New York City, and we stayed in this big hotel right next to the Grand Central Station. And I looked at, look at these buildings. I was taking movies of the Pan Am Tower. Oh my God, look at how well that thing is. Couldn't believe it. I always wondered years later whatever happened with the Commodore Hotel because I never heard any more about it. Well, come to find out, it was bought by Donald Trump. And he renovated the hotel and put a modern facade in the whole thing. And that was a very novel thing to do at the time, apparently, and that's one of the things that helped build his reputation as a real estate developer uh, in New York City. So anyways, I went off to spend a summer in 1973 in Sweden. Uh, I was actually placed with a family uh, that had its own island in the Stockholm Archipelago on an 80-acre uh, private island. Uh, and it turns out that my whole family actually was in the kind of the boat business here. Uh, these are the family postcards. Uh, this is one of the ships that their family built in 1820. This was one of their ships, uh, one of their cargo ships, Brodine Shipping, and they used to actually travel the St. Lawrence River here, so my host father would tell me what the weather was here. Uh, the first night I got to, got to their winter home in uh, suburban Stockholm, I 
new host brother took me up to my host father's office and said, here, let me show you our boats. And here's all these framed pictures of these cargo ships. <laughs> uh, so it was a very interesting experience. And most of it was spent on the island uh, just then. It was their private island. Uh, my mother, God bless her, she said, she told me before I left, she said, Brad, you know, the community raised money to send you on this trip. So I really would appreciate it if you would write back and tell me how it's going and such, and I can put this in the newspaper. So I said, okay, I'll do that. So here actually is the first letter that I wrote uh, back to her. It starts out, dear mom, wow, three exclamation points. This is some house. <laughs> and I went on to talk about the trip over and everything. Well, lo and behold, my host father, uh, Olaf Brodeen, had a brother, Eric Brodeen, who lived in New York City. He had, in a, he, he had a marine insurance business. He had a business partner, I don't know what his name was, who had a place, summer place up here in the Thousand Islands. Well, he would come up here, see my stories in the newspaper, and he figured out, well, this guy must be living with my brother. <laughs> so he would clip these out, and three weeks later, it ended up right back with my host family. <laughs> uh, so this is the very first letter that I wrote in the in, what it looked like in the paper, and once I found that out, I was a little less honest in what I said. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing that uh, they were going to read it. Uh, my mother also told me to keep a diary, so I did, trip to Sweden. And I just wanted to read you, uh, this was toward the end of my stay there, uh, Friday, August 10th. Uh, this would be 1973. Uh, I have gone to bed mad. I'm sick of being told all the things I'm doing wrong. I write too much. I don't push my chair into the dinner table. And now, the latest, I don't sleep at night because I lay in my bed too much during the day writing letters and things. I'm trying to do what they want, uh, want me to do in what they think is right. But I just don't know anymore. Everything is on a schedule here. The, this is done today, that is done tomorrow. The only problem is the schedule is set up in Swedish. <laughs> and I don't speak Swedish, so I never know what's to be done. So I have to be told, wait until I was told, I'm sick of the whole mess. <laughs> well, maybe, I pray, maybe getting off this damn island will help. I only have a few more days here, which will make four straight weeks since we've been back in Stockholm. I like my family. I think they like me, Corinne's, uh, despite all of my faults. <laughs> uh, and then I say, I, I'll live. I have for almost uh, two months now. I can hold on for two more weeks. God bless me. I know it's good for me. <laughs> and it was. And that changed my life and, and uh, led to my career in international uh, diplomacy. Uh, I found also in my archives here, uh, one of the things I discovered, courtesy of all the different organizations in Clayton, is that I had some ability to speak publicly. And I learned that and honed that on the circuit in Clayton. After I got back, I found a list I had spoken 11 times in the community, the Travelers Club, the Lions Club. Here is the article from Ann Ryman and me being at the Lions Club. Uh, interestingly, the only two people in our graduating class who, to my knowledge, went to college outside of New York State were Ann Ryman and myself. Ann had gone on a choir exchange to Russia, and I had gone on an exchange program to Sweden. And I think in both cases that gave us the confidence uh, to actually you know, think bigger than our immediate surroundings. I know that I certainly did. And I chose to go to American University in Washington, D.C., sight unseen. Uh, so I applied there, got accepted, and went there, as I say, sight unseen, uh, to study uh, political uh, science. Got a great education there as well. And that led to my career in politics uh, before I ended up getting into international relations. Uh, over the course of the years, uh, I have uh, uh, played up and talked up Clayton all over the world because I've had a chance to travel. I tell people how beautiful it is. Uh, I felt like I got a terrific education here. It never set me back one little bit. 
Uh, there was a real sense of community here in this little town, and I would describe my town, you know, we got a stoplight. We have a stoplight. It turns to a at midnight, but we have one. We also have a cop, and if the car's going the other direction, do whatever you want in the rest of the town. <laughs> so, uh, in closing, I, I would just say, uh, I have not a single regret about my father being transferred to the conservation department and not wanting to live in the big city of Watertown. Uh, and growing up here in Clayton is, uh, I have so many fond memories that it's been my honor to share some of them with you today. So thank you. Any questions for Brad? You went to Sweden. Yes. Did they speak English? Yes. Okay. My, well, my parents spoke English. My whole brother uh, was so-so speaking English. But the reason I, I, it was a, it was, I was informed upon arrival that the reason I was there was because Ula, Ola, Ali, however you wanted to pronounce it, who was my host brother, was supposed to spend the summer in the UK polishing his English, but didn't want to leave their island. So they just found a program where they could import somebody to speak English to their son. That's why I was there. Uh, and uh, being a Swedish family, they were, uh, uh, Swedes are very, you know, self-sufficient, very do-it-yourself. And even though this family was apparently one of the wealthiest families in the country, I mean, the, the painting in their living room in their winter home was on a postage, Swedish postage stamp. Uh, but they, they worked so hard. And every day I was on that island. I mean, I spent the summer digging ditches, ironically, because they wanted to put the overhead wires underground on their island so they wouldn't be seen. So he and I were out there. We were digging these ditches, and, and we'd have to go out. They, they, the family at one time uh, used to own 22,000 acres of the Stockholm Archipelago, uh, and they still maintain the hunting and fishing rights for that entire acreage. So we go out every night. This was like National Geographic stuff to put these big nets in the sea and get up the next morning and come up and haul off the nets and pull the fish out. And then we have to clean the fish and clean the nets. And you know, and then it would be tea time and then it would be digging time. And oh my God, uh, I never worked so hard in my life as I did over there. Uh, I thought when I left, quite frankly, that uh, you know maybe I didn't work out quite so well here because even though they were very lovey dovey with themselves and their two kids, uh, you know, there were no hugs or kisses with me. It was a shake your hand, thanks for coming type thing. Then, oh, well, you know, whatever. Uh, then April, the next April, I get this uh, uh, letter from my host mother. Dear Summer Son, we'd like to have you come spend the summer with us again. And I thought, <laughs> oh my God, this family never would have invited me back if I hadn't passed their test in some way. So I accepted, uh, went back, and the first week we're on the island, and I'm out there digging, and I thought, like, am I nuts? What am I doing? <laughs> I'm the first summer of doing this. Uh, but on the point about speaking English, one of the most interesting dinners we had was one night out on the island, uh, they had the uh, captain of one of their ships um, staying the weekend, and they also had a friend of my host father from Switzerland spending the weekend. So at dinner that night, we're sitting there, and my host parents are speaking Spanish to the captain, German to the uh, to the guy from Switzerland, Swedish to their kids, and English to me. Wow. At one dinner, that wow. was pretty impressive. Yeah. Anything else? Wow. I think a lot of the European people like. With this whole thing going on in Romania, there, it may not be perfect English, but it's amazing the number of people that are speaking English. Uh, absolutely, uh, as I've been around the world, there's almost no place I've gone where I couldn't be understood by by somebody. And one of the things that that, that trip did was uh, convince me, that, and I believe this passionately. If every young person could have an opportunity to get out of this country, even if they went to London. Uh, the buses are different, the food is a little different, the street lamps look different. You know, it gives you a different perspective and it totally changes your life. Uh, uh, when I was there the second summer, that's when Nixon resigned. And I was in Sweden, I had to get up at two o'clock in the morning and turn on a shortwave radio and I'm going, <laughs> <laughs> and 
and there he was. I'm there at 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'm sitting there thinking, like, this has never happened in my country before. Uh, and the next day, I remember saying to my host brother, you know what? Uh, our president just changed, and nobody shot anybody, and there wasn't any kind of coup or anything. I mean, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so it was a very memorable thing, and I spent, uh, I have spent a lot of my professional career in international uh, diplomacy uh, and had the honor, quite frankly, of running the largest uh, international exchange program of the U.S. government for up-and-coming professionals from around the world, uh, uh, from 189 countries, and we bring them to the U.S. on tailored programs to their specific professional interests. And about 5,000 people a year, I had a um, $80 million budget and 100 staff, and, uh, and one of the only people at the State Department who not only had an international constituency, constituency, bringing all these people to the U.S., but I had a domestic constituency because there were 90-some nonprofit organizations around the country full of volunteers that if it was decided that the visitors should go to their community, they put together the program. So they kind of worked for me, too, on the outside. So it was one of the best jobs ever. Loved it. And it, but the point was getting people to meet each other, getting people to understand that there's more than one way to do things, that we're, we don't have the market on every good idea, uh, and uh, have no regrets about anything that I did in my professional career either. So Jamie and I would, uh, con um, I would come up here after I went to college, come back, visit, be with my mom on holidays and such. Well, she lived with us her last 10 years in Washington and Boston, and so we would bring her up to the river for a week every summer, and we would rent a cottage at Roosevelt Trailer Park, where I used to mow the lawn, and we'd have her in one cottage, and we'd be in another with a cottage in between, uh, and she'd have an opportunity to see her friends and such, and then finally in 2005, we bought our, our cottage over on Wellesley Island, and in 2013, moved up here uh, full-time, and it's wonderful to be back. If anybody wants to look at any of this stuff, it's, uh, it's up here. Right. Uh, before we actually close, uh, Brad, I want to point out that uh, Brad and actually Karen, uh, behind the scenes for the sesquicentennial, uh, they've taken the historic walking tour, and they've gone through and they've made a lot of updates, but I know that Brad's using his past experience uh, as, as a youth, like you talked about today, the things he learned uh, as a historian uh, with his mom, but also, so there is a new uh, walking historic uh, map. It's uh, going to need to be get printed. Chamber's working on that. But I just wanted to point out that uh, he's on the historical committee and he's uh, doing a lot of great things. But I do have a sesquicentennial. Uh, uh, well, thank you, sir. Yeah. Appreciate yeah. it very much. Thank everyone. Thank everyone. Thank everyone. Uh, very captivating uh, uh, speaker. You had my interest right from the well, book, and, and I never looked away. Well, so, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you Thank very you. much, and, and uh, a pleasure to be here.